Okay, so my name is David Cox, and I'm a professor of biology and computer science at Harvard. And I'm going to tell you today about an exciting new frontier at the intersection of neuroscience and computer science. And part of what's exciting about this is that neuroscience and computer science are two of the fastest moving fields uh, that we have today. And for many of you, when you think about neuroscience, you might, the first thing that comes to mind might be medicine and health. But I'm going to argue, I'm going to try and convince you that actually neuroscience uh, is much bigger than that and that the stakes are much larger. So science is about understanding the world around us, but it's also about understanding where we fit into that world. And it's human nature to look at ourselves and try and understand how we fit in, and, and more than just how we fit in, how we're special. And there are, there are many things that we could think about being special uh, that are different about humans from the rest of the world. And we might even be tempted to think that we're some sort of pinnacle of evolution. But it turns out that biology teaches us otherwise. We're just one out of millions of species on this planet, each of which is exquisitely adapted to its niche. We're not the most numerous species. We're not the largest. We're not the fastest or the strongest. We're not the longest lived. We're not the most resilient. So what, if anything, makes us special? Arguably, the thing that makes us unique is our complexity. But not complexity in some generic sense. Nature is rife with complexity. What makes us special is the complexity of our brains. We, more than any other species, can learn and adapt and shape our environments, pass on culture, and we've spread to every corner of the planet and even beyond it. Every work of art, every edifice of our civilization is born of activity in our brains and born of the complexity of our minds. And meanwhile, we're slaves to that complexity. If, if that complexity strays even just a little bit, we can collapse underneath it and have mental disorders and disease. And um, at the same time, all of the great things that our, uh, that our complexity is able to produce also produces all the bad things uh, that, that are facing us today. So I would argue that understanding the brain is tantamount to understanding who we are. And I think we should all be interested in neuroscience. Um, I may be biased. Um, and we've been thinking about it for a long time. So what is it about the brain? What is it about this complexity? Uh, how does it work? And uh, interestingly, when we look out into the world, oftentimes we look at it through our, the lens of our own technology of our day. So in the 17th century, Descartes, a great philosopher and mathematician, uh, thought about the brain in terms of the technology of the day, which was hydraulic technology. So he believed that the seat of the soul was the pituitary gland and that fluids animated our body, uh, much like, like a hydraulic system would. Fast forward to the 19th century, Sigmund Freud used the analogy of the technology of his day, the steam engine, talked about pressure being released and built up, talking about the uh, mental states of, of our minds being driven by the engines of our conscious and subconscious. And we fast forward to the 20th century, the era of radio and, and electronics, and all of a sudden we start talking about our mental processes these ways. We talk about wavelengths and crossed wires and channels. And now today, we have computers. Uh, so increasingly neuroscientists talk about circuits, and we talk about uh, brains uh, passing information and processing information. We talk about networks. As our technology advances, so too do our metaphors. And it's very easy to be led astray by our metaphors. Uh, there are many ways in which our brains are not like the computers we have on our, on our desks or in our pockets. But what's different about computer science and computers is that this, is actually, this metaphor is actually more than just a metaphor. Um, computer science gives us the formal tools to evaluate a computational system, a system that processes information. So even when we're, dealt, we're faced with something that has a different implementation, we can separate out what's computed, an algorithm, from how we compute it, an implementation. And this gives us tremendous power to reason about 
computational systems, including ourselves. So why is this important? Well, first of all, um, health today, mental health, uh, is, is in many ways the last frontier of neuroscience. Increasingly, we're able to treat many of the diseases and disorders that afflict humanity, but mental disorders, diseases, are in many ways the, the sort of last frontier, and part of the reason for that is that our tools that we use to treat them are relatively crude. So most of these pills, this is Prozac, are small molecules that target uh, molecular systems, receptors, um, that act throughout the brain and, in fact, throughout the body. Prozac actually also works on the heart. Um, because they have such diffuse effects, it's very hard to target their action, and it's very hard to prevent off-target effects. In many ways, it would be like going to your IT department with your computer to have them fix it, and all they could do was to change the silicon properties of the computer chips inside. They might be able to fix the problem some of the time, but that's not really the right uh, level of analysis, the right, the right uh, approach to fixing that problem. Instead, you really need to understand the software of the system. And if we could understand the software of the brain, then complex disorders like schizophrenia and obsessive compulsive disorder and depression, which aren't caused by any sort of overt, obvious damage to the brain, uh, but are probably more like miswirings and, and problems in the software. And increasingly, we're starting to get to the point where we do uh, understand at a computational level some of the codes that the brain uses that we can then interface with. So on, on the left here, we have a cochlear implant, which is one of the earliest uh, sort of bionic implants. It's, it's a series of electrodes that are inserted into the cochlea of the ear, and you can restore hearing uh, in some cases. So this is a direct interface to our nervous system. On the right, we have brain gate. So this is uh, a, a, an exciting new technology, but also at a very crude sort of uh, infancy stage. Uh, here, this woman is uh, quadriplegic, and that thing on her head is actually an electrode array that's inserting electrodes into her brain, and then those electrodes are reading activity from her motor cortex and then using it to move an arm. So increasingly, uh, we can interface with the brain if we understand how, how it works. Now, there's an even bolder and broader set of things we can do if we can understand at a computational level how the brain works. So if we could take those codes, if we really understood how the brain works, we should be able to build it. And the, the famous physicist Richard Feynman once said, that which I do not understand, I cannot build. Or that which I cannot build, I, I do not understand. So uh, that's really the mantra of, of what my lab does. And through this lens, we're, we're basically looking and asking, can we reverse engineer the brain? Can we study the brain's wiring and circuitry so that we can build computer systems that work the same way? So the, the, the consequences of this might not be immediately obvious. So let's just take a moment to think about all the different jobs in the world. So uh, here we have some factories uh, making cars, making iPhones. We have people sweeping the street. We have people looking at poultry. A surprising fraction of the world's jobs mostly require a working visual system, so we can see and understand what we're seeing, and a working motor system, so we can take hands and we can move them and we can manipulate our environment. But at the point at which we can recreate these abilities in computers and in robots, uh, a lot's going to change. So here are some very crude robots that are, are sort of the advanced guard in, in this new revolution. Uh, we have the iRobot Roomba, which is basically replacing uh, somebody sweeping the floor. It, it has very simple, uh, uh, simple brain in it, perhaps more like an insect than like a person. We also have these industrial robots um, which have been around for quite a while, but what these require is a highly controlled environment where the, the robot needs to move, it needs to have the thing be where it needs to be at the moment it needs it to be there. And it's all a very highly choreographed, very highly controlled system. But increasingly, we're finding robots now that are going to break that mold. So already, we have this advanced guard of Asimo, which is a bipedal walking robot made by Honda. Uh, it doesn't have a purpose per se, other than to be a showcase for robotics. But uh, people are already starting to think about using robots like this for domestic servant kind of uh, roles. We also have this robot Baxter, uh, which is uh, from Boston, 
uh, startup coming out of MIT. And what Baxter is, is, a, is a, it's a robot with two hands that can be trained alongside a human to perform tasks. And increasingly more uh, beyond the, the industrial robots that we showed you uh, in the car factory, this system can adapt to different conditions. It has some rudimentary vision. So as we, as we imagine to uh, have an understanding of the brain and be able to build more and more complex abilities into our computers, then we're going to see a renaissance in robotics, and that's really going to change uh, just about everything about our economy. There are also jobs that aren't jobs currently. So there are a lot of things we'd like to do that, we, that hum only humans can do, um, but that we can't scale up to a scale that we need. So this is an example that's, that's literally close to home for me. Um, the Boston Marathon bombers um, planted a bomb. They were caught by many, many cameras. So the, it turns out now nearly every storefront, uh, every shop has a camera in it. Uh, people are taking pictures of the event. Um, they were documented multiple times moving around, dropping the, the bomb. But interestingly, even after the fact, when the authorities collected together all of the images, it wasn't possible to find out who they were. They had pictures of them. They, they, they had pretty much right on the spot. You can see one picture there. Um, here's another picture. Uh, and uh, this turns out that this is one of the, the bombers right here. And then lots and lots of these, these photos. But it turns out that uh, face recognition software was not useful at all in, in uh, discovering these bombers, even though we had many pictures of them. And we had pictures to match against the technology that we have currently for doing machine vision, for having computers look at images and understand them uh, wasn't up to the task. Now, we know that humans can do this task because uh, the friends of these brothers saw these pictures online and then went and, and uh, destroyed some evidence. Uh, so they were clearly able to do it. Um, but what we weren't able to do was to deploy at scale the kind of human resources that we'd need. This is just something that computers can do well and, and humans can't. So if we can build human abilities into machines, then scalability becomes uh, not an issue anymore. So we want to study the brain. We want to reverse engineer it. Uh, that's an awfully big piece to bite off all at once. Uh, so it turns out the human brain has 100 billion neurons in it, and it has 100 trillion connections. So we can't just understand it all at once. So what we do and what, what many other labs do is to focus on one subsystem in particular. And for a variety of reasons, I study vision. Now, obviously, vision, for the examples I gave you, has sort of industrial relevance that's hard to argue with. But in addition, it's one of our most natural senses. We, as primates, use our vision all the time. We're very good at vision. And, and we frankly take it for, for granted. So um, if we look at an image like this one, even if you haven't seen this structure, this is close to where, uh, where I live. Uh, Instantly, without any effort, you're able to read out all kinds of information about this scene. So you can tell that this is a castle. You could tell me which way the wind is blowing. You could probably tell me how cold it was that day. Um, if I take another picture, like this camel, even if you haven't been to the Gobi Desert and you've never seen a camel like this before, you instantly recognize that this is a camel. You could probably tell me what it would sound like to walk on the ground on, uh, on, in the scene. So all of that you got instantly from the image, and you didn't have to exert any effort. And one of the things that, that's, that's uh, frustrating, frankly, about studying vision is that everyone thinks it's easy, because you just look at things and you see them. But the reason it's easy is because you have the solution to the problem in your head, and it evolved over hundreds of millions of years. So let me give you some insight on why this is actually so hard for computers to do, even if it's easy for humans to do. So for one thing, here's an object in the world that's one I care about quite a bit. This is my daughter. Uh, this is presumably the first picture you've ever seen of my daughter. Um, but if I show you another picture uh, in a slightly different pose, uh, different lighting, everyone can instantly recognize that this is the same person. This is the same thing in the world. Uh, but at a pixel level, these images have almost nothing to do with each other. The colors are different. The arrangement of pixels is different. Uh, computers have a very hard time telling those two things are the same thing. 
Uh, and we can also deal with incredibly uh, rich and complicated uh, occlusions and different views and lightings. We can instantly recognize that. And it's, it's frustrating at some level to try and build computer vision systems, systems that can do what we can do, because we take it for so much for granted, and it's actually such a hard problem. So any given object in the world can cast infinitely different images on your retina. And actually, it turns out the converse is true as well. So any given image in the world can correspond to infinitely many different objects in the world. So has anyone figured out what's going on in this image? Who says magnets? Oh, no, no, no magnets today. So this is actually an illusion. And actually, many of these illusions are playing on this, this, this tricky piece about vision. So any given object can cast infinitely many different images, because we can change your view and lighting. But any given image could actually correspond to infinitely many different objects. And uh, this particular illusion was constructed to, to, uh, to take advantage of that. I mean, one interpretation of me looking out at this audience is that I'm standing inside a sphere, and you're all just painted on uh, that sphere in this particular arrangement. It's not a good interpretation of the world, but it's a valid one. It's actually, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no proof that that's not the, the answer. Uh, and this is what we call in, in science an ill-posed problem. We have a three-dimensional world outside, and we're measuring it with a two-dimensional structure. Our retina is a two-dimensional structure. So we have to make inferences. We have to be guessing about what's in the world. And our, our visual system is very good at guessing the right thing. It gets it right more often than wrong. And that's why visual illusions are so compelling, is because uh, they violate those, those usually very good assumptions. The other thing about vision is we're constantly dealing with incredibly complex and ambiguous information. So here we have a street scene. And I think all of you could probably make an estimate of how many people roughly are in this image. And I think we'd all agree that there are people on the other side of the street as well, right? So there's people in the foreground. We can see them somewhat clearly. There's also people in the background. If we zoom in on part of that background, uh, this is what was. This is what you were actually looking at. This is exactly the same information, just blown up a little bit. And if we cover this up, um, you were certainly able to recognize that there were people on the other side of the street, but you didn't actually have any information to to, sh to prove that or to give you that impression. The information you used to know that there were people on the other side of the street was the context. You were able to integrate a model of knowing about how street scenes work, knowing how people, where they should be, where the heads would be, and you're able to infer a lot of things, and perhaps even uh, to the level of almost hallucinating the, imp the impression that there were these, these, uh, these faces, even though you couldn't see them. There wasn't actually any real information. So this, these are amazing abilities that we don't yet know how to build into computers. So how do, what do we know, though, about biology? So, if we take an image in the world, the photons are projected onto the retina, which is a two-dimensional layer of tissue on the back of the eye that, that transduces the photons into electrical signals, goes across the optic nerve to the brain. Now, the brain is a massively parallel computer made up of 100 billion elements in humans. And each neuron, so each, each computational element, is actually a computer unto itself. So it takes inputs in, and it puts outputs out. Uh, over some ten, uh, some hundred trillion connections between these neurons. Now, we know something, it's not just diffusely organized, it's actually a very interesting structure to the visual system. It's arranged hierarchically. So information comes into the back of the brain into an area called V1, and then successively information is sent to way stations where it's processed and transformed. And these areas are called V1 for visual area 1, V2, V4, don't worry about where V3 went. And then there's an area called TE, which is the temporal cortex. And there are actually quite a few more visual areas. It turns out that in vision, there's a segregation between our processing of what something is and our processing of where it is and how fast it's moving and things like that. So uh, some of the other V numbers uh, correspond to that other stream of processing. So it's interesting what happens. If you, if you record from the neurons in these areas and measure their activity, you find that Neurons in area V1 are primarily concerned with small, simple structures, like little edges. And then if we go up to the highest levels in area TE, also called area IT, we find really interesting neurons. So here's a, a figure from the 1980s from Robert Desimone. And what he did was he showed a monkey with an electrode in its brain in this area images of face and an image, uh, images of scrambled faces. So they have comparable complexity, uh, visually, roughly speaking, but this one forms together to form a face, and that one does not. 
And what you see above is the firing of the neuron in the brain. So you don't need to worry too much about what, the, what this means, other than up means more firing, and that way means forward in time. And this little bracket shows you when the stimulus was up. So you, without you know, thinking too hard about it, you can clearly see that this neuron seems to like faces. It fires when you see faces. And this is actually quite magical when you have a, an electrode uh, recording from a neuron and you're showing stimuli and figuring out what the cell fires in response to. But uh, it's, it's probably a little bit more complex than just saying that this is a face neuron. But at the same time, it's reasonable to say that this neuron represents, uh, represents the face. So then we take all this information and then what my lab and other labs do is trying to take inspiration from the natural system and what we can glean and what we know about the natural system and then build an artificial system that shares the same structure and shares uh, aspects of the same processing. And where the natural brain is made up of billions of neurons, the artificial system is built up of artificial neurons that are basically functions. So what we need to do is study the system, figure out how to build versions like that. And then we can deploy these in a variety of contexts. My lab uses these for face recognition, face detection. We also use them for robot navigation um, and a variety of other different tasks. So the problem is that the processing power of the brain is actually quite a bit more than the processing power of a computer. So it's at least, uh, at least petaflops of computational power in the brain, which is remarkable also considering that it only dissipates somewhere between 15 and 20 watts. So it's using about as much power as your laptop, and yet it's as powerful computationally as some of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. So that's uh, an interesting fact in and of itself. Now, in the meantime, before we, you know, eventually we'll figure out how to, how to get that power efficiency, but in the meantime, what we do is we build up large clusters. We use lots of computers to try and mimic the power or, or the abilities of a brain. And we'll worry about the power later. We'll figure out, uh, and this is one, again, one of the great things about computer science is you can divorce the algorithm from the implementation. We can figure out how to implement it efficiently later. And you may have heard uh, stories about how uh, there was a group associated with IBM that claimed that they had assembled enough computational power to simulate the brain of a cat. Uh, this was big news about five years ago. Um, and it, it's a bit of a curious claim, uh, but it's an illustrative one. So it's, it's sort of like saying you took aluminum and bolts and put them together and you got an airplane. Uh, I, I don't particularly want to fly on an airplane uh, if somebody just told me I've assembled enough aluminum and enough bolts to build an airplane, I'd actually like to see that plane fly. So in the case of this cat, if it's not chasing mice and catching mice, uh, our, our job sort of isn't done. And this is really the hard part. So you'll find people claiming that they've built these supercomputers and we can finally simulate brains. The question is, what does that brain do? And does that brain actually do the important things and the interesting things that brains can do? Or does it just have uh, sort of a, a virtual uh, seizure. And there's actually a huge uh, European Union project, uh, multi-billion euro project, uh, aimed at simulating a huge brain, but not necessarily with, with a whole lot of emphasis on what the, what the brain's gonna do. And there's differences of opinion about whether that's a good idea. So this is actually an incredibly uh, ripe time to be, to be in this area. So it turns out we've been studying these, these artificial brain-like systems, they're called artificial neural networks, for a very long time. In fact, in the 40s, uh, the first neural network ideas uh, sort of were born. In the 80s, they became a, a big thing. And then in the 90s, they hadn't quite delivered yet, so the whole thing collapsed, and there was something called the AI winter, but today, uh, is actually a really sweet time to be in this business because uh, the systems have gotten pretty good. And you might have heard stories like these. So um, Google just bought a company called DeepMind for half a billion dollars. And that was entirely based on this technology of building brain-inspired computational systems. And meanwhile, Google and Baidu and Twitter and Facebook are basically hiring up a huge fraction of the field. Actually, Mark Zuckerberg showed up this past year at uh, one of our field's major conferences and basically hired everyone in sight. Uh, so so it, the, the, there's, there are people at Google now who are, who are claiming uh, sort of back of the envelope that perhaps 10% of the best people in the field now work for uh, these companies. So it's, it's an unprecedented privatization uh, of an entire academic field. And um, 
at some level, that, that's at least an indication that, that some of the smart money, at least, is, is thinks that there's some 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 gas here. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that this wasn't really driven by some conceptual advance that happened. It's much more driven by computational power and the availability of big data. So uh, Google and YouTube alone collects hundreds of hours of video per minute. So that's just a huge, huge amount of data. And they have the computational resources. They have the server farms to run it. And in many ways, the systems that are now available that Google's getting so excited about buying and that are winning a lot of these academic benchmarks and challenges uh, over in the academic field, what's changed isn't so much that we've understood something new about the brain. A lot of our insights were from, from the 80s, uh, but what's changed is now we have huge amounts of data. But at the same time, a lot of the tasks that we'd like to solve, like the Boston Marathon bombing, like that complex street scene, we still aren't able to do. We aren't able to do them just with lots and lots of data and just with lots and lots of compute power. We need more information. We need more clues about how the system is organized. So fortunately, uh, there's sort of two huge tidal waves that are on a collision course with one another. So on one hand, we have all this data, and we have an unprecedented amount of compute power, and we have some real traction where we're starting to get useful applications coming out of these computer algorithms. But on the other hand, neuroscience is going through an absolute revolution in new tools and techniques. Um, and my lab uh, is a bit unusual in that we try and actually do both. So in addition to building computer algorithms of the sort that, uh, that Google's interested in, we also want to go into the brain and look for clues about what we should build next and get data that we can use to constrain the algorithms that we build. So this uh, is roughly speaking how we uh, reverse engineer a brain. So you imagine if you had a competing product uh, that another, one of your competing companies produced and you didn't know how it worked, but you really wanted to know how it worked, you might buy the product open it up, I mean, there are laws against that in some places, but you might do it anyway. You open it up, you put some, some, uh, some oscilloscope probes in, and you try and figure out how it works. You reverse engineer the system. And roughly speaking, we can do the exact same thing with nature. It just so happens that instead of being a competing product, it's actually uh, usually a warm-blooded furry creature, so, uh, or a human. Uh, so what we have here are some of the, the, this is pretty much the earliest technology for reverse engineering the brain. This is a tungsten microelectrode. So this is basically a wire that you can hook up to an amplifier. These are two neurons. And this gets down to about 20 microns, or 20 thousandths of a millimeter uh, at the very tip. And then uh, traditionally what you do is you go and you park an electrode next to a neuron, and you listen to it. You literally put the amplifier to a, uh, to a speaker and you can listen to the cell. And the way cells communicate with each other is by something called action potentials, or spikes, and they're little popping noises. So you can actually hear, uh, you know, as you stimulate the cell or you show a, an image, you can hear a little tick, 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 tick of the cell firing, and that's what this lets you do. Now, what's exciting is that uh, through all kinds of innovations in other industries, we've now increasingly have access to much better versions of this technology. So this is a kind of electrode array that we use in my laboratory. This is a silicon micro-machined electrode array. So it's got an array. You can see there's these little dots, our iridium uh, electrode recording pads. So it's sort of like one of those, except now we can have uh, dozens or hundreds of them. And then this basically sticks into the brain, and we can wiretap a much larger number. And then this is something new that we're developing uh, or starting to use in my lab. Uh, these are carbon, uh, carbon microwires. So these are each five microns in diameter, or about a twentieth of the width of a human hair. We can get huge numbers of these now into brains. We can snake them in. And then because they're so flexible, they're actually almost impossible to see with the naked eye because they're so small. Uh, they can kind of float in the brain. The brain's always pulsing because there's uh, blood flowing through it. Uh, but these guys can sort of float in the brain, and then we can get isolations for a very long period of time. Now, these are the old school technologies, frankly. This is sort of the, 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 that was the updated version of old technologies. But there's actually quite a bit of, quite a number of new, exciting technologies that are also available. So this picture uh, was, I just learned was taken by Feng Zhang, who just gave the last Beta Zone presentation. I, I stole it without knowing it was his. And, and uh, anyway, thanks, Feng. Uh, so this is uh, an example of optogenetics. So what this is, is uh, particularly two researchers, Carl Dizeroff and Ed Boyden, 
at Stanford and MIT respectively, uh, developed a way to introduce uh, ion channels, proteins from other species, and in some cases engineered version of those proteins from other species, into neurons. And then what this lets you do is it lets you shine light on the cells and then you can either turn them on or turn them off. So it's a little bit like installing an on-off switch in neurons. And because these are targeted with genetic technologies, you can target specific kinds of cells. There's different cell types in the brain. So we can you know, give certain cells a kick. We can turn off certain cells. We can start to manipulate the circuit. So again, this is if we're reverse engineering a brain, these are the kinds of things you want to be able to do. You want to be able to selectively probe different parts of the circuit and see what happens. Um, in addition, we also have uh, new optical technologies for recording the activity. So I showed you the old school thing, which was putting an electrode in and measuring the electrical potentials near the cell. But there's actually quite a few new technologies. So this is a picture of, of an instrument in my lab. It's called a two-photon excitation microscope. And what we do, uh, so the rat, roughly speaking, would go right here. And this is a little wheel he can run on. And then this is a powerful laser that we shine into his brain. And what the reason shining a laser into the brain works in this case and lets us see activity is because we've also introduced a genetically encoded calcium indicator. So when cells fire, calcium rushes into the cell, and then these genetically encoded fluorophores will light up when, when, when the, the cell is active. So if you look here, you just saw there was a cell that's sort of glowing. You're watching right now a series of cells, each one of these round bodies is a cell in the rat's visual cortex, and as it lights up and, and gets dimmer, you're watching the activity of the cell. So when the cell fires, it gets brighter, and we can use this technology to record from hundreds of cells. And critically, we can record from those same cells over long periods of time. So you can imagine learning not just how the, the brain works sort of in its final steady state, but you can also start to study how the brain changes over time. And this is the kind of thing that when we're building machine learning technologies, we really like to see them the learning uh, in action. And then there are other exciting technologies. So this is uh, something that's happening just down the hall for me. So this is Bobby Casturi and his advisor, Jeff Lickman. Um, and what we see here is an electron micrograph of a brain. So what we can do is we can take uh, the brain that I just showed you, where we're watching the activity, we can take the brain out. Uh, so this is one thing that's not great to do in humans, but you can do it in rats. Um, and we take the brain out, and we've imaged those cells so we know what their activity was like. But then we can actually slice with a very fine knife uh, the brain, and we can look at the very fine structures of, of, of the tissue. So this is an example of one image, but it's actually part of a large volume of tissue that's imaged this way. And the reason you need to use an electron microscope is because these features are actually too small to image with light. So the wavelength of light would actually be something like this. So it's just light is too big to interact with how small these things are. But with an electron microscope, we can slice and reconstruct, and then we can trace the wiring. So we can literally get the wiring diagram from the very same cells that we were just imaging to get their activity. And this is an incredibly powerful technique. That, uh, that Jeff Lickman has largely pioneered and that we're joining forces to, to use. And here's an example of a uh, uh, single uh, cell's dendrite, which is the input process, and then all of the uh, other processes connecting onto it. So I told you there were 100 trillion connections. These are the connections to just one of those neurons in one place. And you can see this incredible complexity of different, uh, different kinds of stuff that are connected. And really, this technology is game-changing because it means that we can uh, know everything about how the brain is hooked up. We can segregate out uh, different kinds of processes, axons, which are the outputs, dendrites, which are the inputs, also uh, a number of different things uh, like glial cells that are supporting cells. Uh, there's unidentified stuff, which I'm fascinated by, but... Uh, uh, there you go. Uh, so it's really an amazing time to be thinking about uh, neuroscience and thinking about how this all fits together. So um, the other thing I should mention, I, 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 a lot of people want to, uh, want to see this work being done in humans, and I think this is actually a mistake. So I mentioned that we were doing this in rats, and there really is a huge advantage to that. So 
Uh, imagine you were an alien coming to Earth, and you didn't know anything about what cars were. You saw these things moving around, but you weren't quite sure what they were. Uh, the, a sensible thing to do would be to get a car and take it apart and try and figure out how it works. Now, you could choose my car, so I took a picture of the inside of my car. This is a 2007 Prius. It's a pretty good car. Uh, it's a complicated car. It's got a uh, very complicated powertrain. It's got a motor and an engine. It's got uh, 13 computers on board, computer-controlled fuel injection. Uh, it's a great car, it's a, it's a marvel of engineering, but if I was trying to study cars, uh, it might not actually be the right car for me to start with. I might prefer to start with the car I learned to drive on, which is a 1980 Ford Pinto. Uh, that's a terrible car, it's not a good car at all, but it's got a carburetor, it's got big parts, it's got spark plugs. Um, it's a, it, just because it's a less good system, uh, it, it might be less good at what it does, it's actually a better system to start with. So this is sort of the training wheels for understanding. And, and what I'm going to argue is that uh, you know, it, it, there is a drive uh, to, to study in humans, because we're humans and we need to study the neuroscience of humans, but really we're not at that stage yet. We're not quite there yet. So what, we, what we're going to do instead is we're going to find the Ford Pinto of nature, uh, which is the rat. And uh, actually, calling a rat a Ford Pinto is totally not fair, because they don't explode. And, uh, and they're actually quite wonderful at what they do. Uh, nearly every organism on Earth is wonderful at what it does. And if it weren't wonderful at what it does, it would be replaced by some other creature that could do what it needed to do better. But it's true that, that their brains are much simpler. Again, this idea that this complexity is what makes us different, like now we need to dial that back. We need to look at something that's, that's simpler. And in sheer numbers, uh, the numbers of neurons are much, much smaller, uh, where the brain is sort of two pounds of stuff in our head. A rat's brain is about this big. So when we do things like connectomics or we do imaging, we can actually start to make some traction. Um, and this is just to, to show you what, uh, what my lab looks like. So because we're studying neuroscience, which is really the biology of behavior, we've built all these rigs um, to control the behavior. So basically what I'm telling you is I have a, an army of trained rats uh, that live in my lab, and these are the rigs we train them in. So it's basically uh, a series of high throughput boxes. We can take the animals, we can put them in. They basically play little video games. Uh, and then we teach them to do stuff so that when then we go and measure their activity in their brain or we measure changes in the activity of their brain, we can do that with respect to an actual thing that the animal is doing. And this is just to give you a sense of what this looks like. So here we're showing, this is a monitor where we're showing the, the animal different objects because we're interested in object recognition. This is a rat down here, so you can see uh, there he is with his whiskers and he's licking. And this is basically, this is basically PlayStation for, for rats. Uh, this is about as good as it gets. Um, so he's just touching these little sensors, these little capacitive sensors, and then they, they put out little bits of juice. And what this lets us do is to have a very fine control over the behavior in a very high throughput way. And we can mix this with all these technologies and bundle this all up, to try and build, uh, he's adorable, isn't he? Um, build up an understanding uh, of how his brain works. He just got one wrong. Um, so this is really, uh, this is an amazing time to, to put all this stuff together. Um, and we're actually uh, starting to assemble a team. And this is, a, this is an enormous undertaking. So the connectomics alone, if we were to take a millimeter cubed of tissue and slice it up and try and image it, that's one and a half petabytes of data. So an enormous quantity of data. Uh, to record from all those neurons, enormous quantity of data, an enormous undertaking, bringing all together all the machine learning uh, expertise that we need to bring together. So what we're doing now is we're assembling a team across Harvard and MIT and a few other institutions, basically to do a very serious take on this reverse engineering of the brain, uh, partly driven by interest now from the government, so the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Administration, which is basically the, the intelligence version of DARPA, which you may have heard of, is now uh, putting out a challenge for groups like ours to assemble and really take seriously this idea that we can take all of these technologies which are, which are right on the cusp, go to the very frontier of what we're able to do with them, put all that information together and really make a front on push. And we're gonna, this is not an easy task for us to, to undertake. It's gonna take money, it's gonna take, uh, it's gonna take academic cooperation, it's also gonna take private cooperation. We're increasingly working with Google now because Google is one of the only uh, entities in the world that can deal with this much data, uh, and we're collaborating with them now. And we're gonna have to bring that all together uh, to make this push, but this sense that, uh, that this really is the sort of the, the key, the crux of our humanity, even if we're studying it in, in, in rodents, uh, 
it, it really makes it sort of the, one of the greatest challenges of our time, sort of to, to go to the frontier and see if we can figure out how these brain systems work and then figure out if we can build them ourselves. So with that, I will close. Thank you. Yeah, Microsoft Research was, was heavily involved in the creation of Microsoft Connect. Uh, the Xbox Connect product was, is, on the one hand, it, it is a way um, to interact with a game, right? interact with a game console. But, but more to, to the point, it's changed the way people think about how computers interact with them and see them and, and perceive them. You know, it not only does a great job of tracking your motion, but it also does a great job of hearing you because of the array microphone that's built into it, because of the speech recognition technology we have in it. And so it's really changed the dynamic. Uh, and, and I think it's changed how people think, even in the research world, about what, what you can do to interact with a computer. So I've seen a huge number of universities using you know, Xbox Connect as a way of experimenting with new kinds of user interface paradigms. And, and thinking about ways in which you know, computers can perceive the world around them in, in, when they really couldn't before. I mean, in some sense, you know, in the very old days with computers, um, they were kind of deaf, dumb, and blind. You, know, you, you can think of the, the old typewriter interfaces as sort of like reverse braille, right? Uh, and that's kind of what those, what those devices were like. They couldn't perceive the world. Now we've given, literally, senses to our computers. They can see, they can hear, they have a sense of motion uh, through accelerometers. They know where they are through GPS. Uh, they can feel by having touch interfaces. You know, and, and that's really changed the dynamic between the computer and the person. As we've given our, our computer senses, right, um, we've given them an ability to act independently that they didn't have before. Uh, you know, if you think about it, you know, if, if all the information you're getting is from somebody typing on a keyboard, you, know, you don't, as a computer, it's hard to write a program for that computer that can, that can decide what it's supposed to be doing. It just does what it's told, right? You type in something to, for it to do, and it does it. Or you click on a mouse, and it does it. Uh, by giving our computer senses, now they can make decisions on their own. You know, they can say, oh, you know, is there anybody in the room, right? So Xbox actually knows, is there anybody in the room? If there's not, you know, maybe I should turn myself off. Uh, is there someone in the room? Okay, now I need to pay attention to that person. Is it the person that was there before or is it a new person, right? Those are things that the system can now do and can take action on independently without having you say anything. You know, and, you know, again, we start to think about how you know, computers can you know, aid people in their lives in a more significant way, that ability to let the computer be able to make decisions because it can, in fact, perceive the world around it in the same way that you do is really important. Thank you for inviting me to NIPS. You know, before I went into quantum computing, I actually started out my first year at Berkeley as a machine learning person. So I get to experience my, you know, an alternate life uh, trajectory here, a different branch of the wave function. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot. Uh, but, you know, it did uh, uh, present a dilemma in terms of what I should talk about because, you know, I could just give a standard technical talk about uh, quantum computing theory, but I wanted to somehow relate it more to NIPS. Uh, so, uh, yeah, quantum information and the brain. So my challenge is going to be to speak uh, for 45 minutes about an intersection of two fields that might be the empty set. Uh, however, uh, we don't know for certain that it is the empty set, and therefore I have something to talk about. Okay, so uh, often, you know, the case that, you know, quantum mechanics might have something to do with uh, cognition is parodied as the argument from two mysteries. You know, the mind is mysterious, quantum mechanics is also mysterious, ergo, they might be related somehow. Okay, so you might wonder, you know, what kind of scientifically irresponsible ignoramus, you know, would even toy with such a, you know, an, uh, an obviously sort of silly idea? 
So okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, all right. So so you know you've may, you've probably heard about Roger Penrose. He actually thinks something you know a hundred times more radical than this, that, you know, the brain is not merely a quantum computer. He thinks that it's a quantum gravitational computer, which could use sort of exotic new physics to solve Turing uncomputable problems. Okay, but moving on to sort of the relative conservatives in this list, right? So, I mean, Arthur Eddington, you know, uh, wrote a great deal about, you know, how maybe, you know, the uncertainty principle is relevant to sort of the free will and determinism discussion, you know, as did uh, Compton, uh, um, Eccles, uh, you know, several other of these people. Um, Alan Turing, maybe surprisingly, was hugely influenced by Eddington uh, throughout his life and actually wrote, you know, several times about how maybe the uncertainty principle, you know, presents some fundamental obstacle to scanning the state of a brain into a computer. Um, Okay, so, uh, you know, even if, you know, this sort of connection is uh, uh, ultimately rejected, it's clear that it's, you know, at least worth considering. Uh, you know, on the other hand, as soon as we start thinking about this, you know, we notice an obvious problem of scale. So here is uh, so, uh, three qubits in an ion trap quantum computer. Okay, and so the, it's less than one nanometer across, you know, and uh, this is a regime where quantum effects are predominant, okay, where, uh, you know, the, in fact, these uh, ions uh, don't even have, you know, definite locations, uh, so to speak. You know, there's just a wave function describing them, okay? You can sort of only, you know, approximately make a picture like this. Uh, so, um, you know, and then on the other hand, here is a neuron, uh, you know, and that may be something like 10,000 nanometers across, okay? And this is a regime where uh, decoherence predominates. So, you know, the uh, uh, neuron is in a bath. It's sort of in uh, contact with its external environment, and that's constantly sort of forcing down its quantum state into a, a classical state. And, uh, you know, this is decoherence is the basic reason why we don't experience Schrodinger cats in the realm of everyday life. Okay, now, there is an intermediate regime. I mean, if you look at a synaptic junction, that's, you know, maybe a few nanometers across. And, you know, in fact, there have been arguments that quantum effects are important for the, you know, modeling the uh, opening and closing of the sodium ion channels, like, the, you know, the, in the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. Okay, but, you know, even then, you know, there's also a huge problem of time. So the physicist Max Tegmark uh, did a calculation of, you know, what is the sort of longest possible time that a quantum uh, superposition might be able to remain coherent in sort of the hot, wet environment of the brain, right? And under generous assumptions, you know, maybe it could last for about 10 to the minus 13 seconds. Okay, so you look at, you know, the neuron firing rate, right, and it's just orders of magnitude different. Uh, you know, here we're looking at, you know, maybe 10 to the minus 3 seconds. Okay, uh, finally, last but not least, there's the problem of cringeworthy claims. So, I mean, if you, um, you know, th think that it's even worth sort of discussing, you know, whether there's a connection between, you know, the mysteries of quantum mechanics and of, and of thought, then you immediately find that your allies uh, are people who uh, think that quantum mechanics means that, you know, you can uh, create reality by, by wishing and that you can channel some... 30,000-year-old uh, uh, cave woman named Ramtha or something. You know, this is from this movie uh, what, called What the Bleep Do We Know, which, by the way, uh, quantum mechanics does not mean those things. Okay. So uh, uh, my view is that barring a scientific revolution, uh, you know, debates about quantum mechanics and mind, you know, will just continue popping up like, you know, whack-a-mole. Okay, and it's not even obvious that they shouldn't uh, because, you know, as I'll discuss, you know, I think that there genuinely is something profound that we don't understand about how quantum mechanics can give rise to the, you know, the definite world that we subjectively perceive. You know, many people have claimed to understand understand it over the last hundred years, but, you know, it's questionable uh, if, if any of them have. Okay, um, so my modest goal in this talk, it's a very modest talk, okay, uh, is going to be to explain, you know, various discoveries in the fields of quantum computing and information that might uh, bear on these debates. Now, along the way, I'll also discuss how a quantum computer could help or not help uh, with your, you know, applied machine learning tasks. Okay, uh, I could have focused the whole talk around that, but, you know, I feel that 
frankly, that that application of quantum computing is sort of already oversold as it is. So I didn't want to sort of fan the flames anymore. Okay. Uh, but then I'll also discuss how, in my own research, uh, concepts from machine learning have actually helped in quantum computing theory. Okay. So. Uh, so the first thing I've got to do is explain quantum mechanics in one slide. Uh, so, you know, I can actually do this because, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, the physicists somehow convinced everyone that quantum mechanics is complicated and hard. Okay, uh, the reality is that, you know, it is, quantum mechanics is unbelievably simple uh, once you take the physics out. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, the way that that I think about quantum mechanics, the way that most of us in quantum computing do, you know, at least most of the time, is that it is a certain generalization of the laws of probability. Okay, what do I mean? So, um, you know, in probability theory, well, what is it? Well, you're, you know, you represent your knowledge at any time, you know, as I don't have to tell uh, you folks, by a vector of non-negative real numbers, which sum to one and which are called probabilities. So this is your state. Okay, uh, if the state, you know, uh, if, this, if the system you're modeling undergoes evolution, then you update your knowledge of the system by taking that vector of probabilities and multiplying it by a matrix, uh, which has to uh, conserve, you know, the one norm or the sum of the probabilities. Such a matrix is, of course, called a stochastic matrix. Okay, now uh, quantum mechanics is just the same thing, except that now instead of a vector of non-negative real numbers, we're going to have a vector of complex numbers. And uh, instead of uh, conserving the one norm of the vector, we are going to conserve its two norm. Okay, a norm which sort of God or nature seems to prefer over the one norm in every circumstance. Okay, fine. So. Um, uh, so now, you know, instead of stochastic matrices, we get to apply any linear transformation we want, you know, in principle, that uh, preserves the uh, two-norm of this vector. Okay, and such matrices have a name. They're called unitary matrices. Okay, so, um, um, okay, now the source of all quantum weirdness, you know, as Richard Feynman sort of liked to emphasize, right, it all just boils down to one thing, uh, which is uh, uh, inter the, the fact that whereas probabilities are non-negative real numbers, amplitudes can be, you know, either positive or negative, and as such, the different amplitudes leading to some outcome can interfere destructively and cancel each other out. Okay, you can see that just by sim considering the simplest possible quantum system, a single quantum bit or qubit. Okay, so the possible states of a qubit just lie, you know, with real amplitudes only, let's say. Uh, the, the amplitudes are what these complex numbers are called. Okay, so, you know, since the sum of the squares of the amplitudes has to be one, they just form a circle. Okay, and now we have two perfectly distinguishable states, which we label by zero and one. So these are orthogonal vectors. Okay, and the physicists like to... Uh, uh, surround them by these little asymmetric brackets, which are called cats. You get used to them with time. Okay, so um, now to, you know, if you have a qubit that's initially in the state zero, you could modify it by applying a unitary transformation like this one here. Uh, this one corresponds to just a 45 degree counterclockwise rotation in the plane. So if you look at what it does, you know, if you applied it once, then you would get, as we say, an equal superposition of the zero and one states. Okay, uh, if you applied that same transformation a second time, then you would rotate further, and then you would rotate all the way to definitely the one state. And you could just keep rotating all the way around. Okay, so already here we see something which is uh, not possible in the classical world, which is that this unitary transformation applies uh, what we could call the square root of not. Okay, it's, it's something that applied in twice in succession gives you the not gate. Okay, and once it's just, you know, the square root of a not gate. Okay, now a, a, a very nice way to understand what's going on is in terms of interference of amplitudes. Okay, so you can think of it this way. When we apply the unitary the first time, it maps zero to an equal superposition of zero and one. When we apply it a second time, well, you know, it acts linearly, and it maps zero to, again, to zero plus one, but it also maps one to minus zero plus one. Okay, and now, you know, there are two different possible paths sort of that you could have taken to go from zero up to zero plus one and then back down to zero, right? There's this path and there's this one. 
Okay, but one of those paths had a positive amplitude and the other had a negative amplitude. As a result, they interfere destructively and cancel each other out, and you see one with certainty. Okay, so, you know, now at some point, of course, you've got to measure your quantum system and see what it's doing. So what happens if you take a qubit, say, which is in a superposition state, alpha zero plus beta one, and you apply a measurement that asks the qubit, are you zero or are you one? Okay, well, what happens is it gives you a probabilistic answer. So it tells you it's zero with probability absolute value of alpha squared and one with probability absolute value of beta squared. Okay, and, you know, of course, the, since our vector was, had unit norm, that gives us a, you know, a, a valid probability distribution. Okay, and crucially, whatever answer it gave, it sticks with it. Okay, it sticks with its story. If you ask it a second time, you know, if it tells you zero and you measure a second time, you're just going to get zero again rather than an independent sample. Okay, so measurement in quantum mechanics, as you may have heard, is a destructive process, right? You get one choice, you know, you get one chance to measure, sort of choose wisely how you want to measure because then, you know, you're going to sort of destroy the superposition. Okay, so, um, you know, the famous illustration of that is uh, the, the double slit experiment where you can take a photon, there's a photon, I'm, you know, I'm not an engineer, I'm a computer science, theoretical computer scientist, uh, and uh, you shoot it at a, a screen with two slits and you look at where will it end up on a second slit and, you know, it, it has a probability distribution over places where it could land, okay, and you find the distribution has this nice uh, wavy pattern, okay, which comes from interference between the amplitude for the uh, photon to be going through this way and the amplitude to it, for it to be going through, through this way. Okay, however, as soon as you start looking to see, well, you know, which slit is the damn thing going through, uh, then you find that it only goes through one slit or the other and the, the wavy interference pattern disappears and you just see uh, to a, to a mixture of two Gaussians. Okay, now I hasten to add that to, in order to destroy the interference pattern, it's not important that you look. Okay, it could, you could just as well destroy the interference pattern if there were some mechanical recording device that were, you know, or in general, any uh, object whatsoever that records the information about which path the photon goes through. Okay, that will destroy the interference pattern just the same. Okay, however, you know, it, that then pushes the question back. And you could then ask, okay, what about the recording device itself? Uh, is that then going to be in a superposition of registering that the photon went through the first slit and registering that it went through the second slit until you look at the recording device, right? Where does the buck stop? Okay, fine. So, um, you know, another way to say, you know, to, to look at this is to just consider um, um, the treatment of multiple qubits. Okay, so if you have just two qubits side by side, you can simply, you know, model it by forming what's called their tensor product. Okay, so the amplitudes multiply. So if you have this state here, you just get alpha times gamma amplitude for zero, zero, and alpha times delta amplitude for zero, one, and so forth. Okay, however, you know, there are some states of two qubits that cannot be decomposed in that way as products, that, as products of two in individual uh, qubits. Those are called entangled. Okay, famous example being the einstein podolsky rosen pair, which is this state zero, zero plus one, one over square root of two. Okay, so this is, you know, the quantum analog of correlation. Okay, it's called entanglement. Okay, now, the deep mystery of quantum mechanics, uh, you know, uh, uh, so to speak, is, well, you know, who decides when measurement happens, right? I mean, presumably, you know, you also are, are made of atoms, you know, your measuring device is made of atoms, and, you know, and they all, those atoms ought to be obeying exactly the same rules of unitary evolution as any other atoms, including the ones that you're measuring, right? So, you know, how or when does, you know, does the universe ever decide to stop this process of unitary Unitary evolution and say, okay, now we're going to have a definite outcome. Okay, well, you know, what you can do is you can say, suppose that you were measuring a qubit, then what would that look like to an outsider that w who was modeling you as a quantum system? Okay, and what it would look like is pretty well understood these days. What it would look like is that initially you've got the qubit 
And then you've got the rest of the world. Okay, and the rest of the world is, uh, you know, initially unentangled with the qubit. However, then some, you know, measurement takes place, which affects a unitary transformation, which has the effect of entangling that qubit with the de degrees of freedom in the rest of the world, including, you know, the atoms, you know, of your brain, okay, but also including, you know, the ambient air in the room and, you know, all sorts of other stuff. And so then, you know, quantum mechanics would predict that you should get a superposition like this. Alpha, zero, and the rest of the world, including you having registered the zero outcome, plus beta, one, and the rest of the world, including you having registered the one outcome. Okay, so this qubit simply gets entangled with you. Okay, so uh, taking this seriously, or, you know, pushing it further, you know, leads to what's called the many worlds interpretation, uh, you know, which says that uh, actually, you know, uh, quantum states never really collapse, you know, you perceive, you know, either a zero or a one, but, you know, the laws of unitary evolution straightforwardly predict that whatever outcome you saw, you know, the other outcome, you know, has not disappeared. It's still there in the quantum state, okay, in some sense, okay, and so then you get the idea that, you know, you have all these, you know, these different branches, you know, one in which I became a machine learning person or whatever, okay? So, um, you know, now my own view is that, you know, you basically just have three possible options. You can accept the many worlds view. You know, you don't have to call it that, right? You can, you know, you could have Bohmian hidden variables. You could, you know, uh, use fancier language, but the many worlds are still going to be there in some sense. Or you could say, look, there has to be some kind of radical new physics that says that once a you know, a state, a, a superposition gets up to some scale of complexity or mass or something, then something new comes in and forces it down to a classical outcome. Okay, or you can just say, well, shut up and stop asking the question. Okay, I'd say that number three is, you know, remains by far the most popular position among physicists. Um, you know, my own view, uh, 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 standpoint is that sort of I agree with every interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, insofar as it criticizes the other interpretations. Interpretations. Okay, so, but now, uh, starting in the, the 1970s, uh, physicist David Deutsch uh, started saying, look, you know, I think that the many worlds are literally there. They're just straightforwardly real, and not only that, there's an experiment that could demonstrate it. Okay, so what was Deutsch's exper uh, experiment? Well, it's very simple. Step one is to build an artificially intelligent quantum computer, <laughs> okay? Uh, so you've got a computer, you know, and it furthermore can, you know, can be manipulated in quantum superposition states. All right, fine. After you've done that, step two is to put this computer into a superposition of thinking one thought and thinking another one. You put it in a superposition of two mental states. And then step three is that you perform a quantum mechanical measurement which would detect the interference. Uh, between these two states, you know, thereby proving that they were both there in superposition. And then, you know, I mean, modulo your belief that this computer was actually conscious, you would then have proved that, yes, a conscious entity can be in a quantum superposition of two different, you know, uh, mental states. Okay, incidentally, the reason why he needed to talk about a computer here is that with a, a human, it's possible that this experiment could never be done, simply because the coupling, you know, is so enormous between, you know, a human brain and, you know, the air in the room, the ambient radiation and all sorts of stuff, right? It's just not practical to, lo to, uh, um, to isolate a brain from its external environment. Okay, but a computer that you get to engineer and, you know, cool it to close to absolute zero and, you know, isolate it from, from you know, from everything else, you know, may maybe in principle this could be done. Okay, so as zany as this sounds, right, this thought experiment of Deutsch was one of the ideas, I think, that led to what today is the field of quantum computation. Okay, so what is the idea of quantum computing? Well, first of all, that's, this is a, when I did a Google image search for quantum computer, this was like one of the first things that came up. That might be what they look like. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a theorist. Okay, so... The basic idea is that a general entangled state of n qubits, you know, actually requires something like two to the n amplitudes to specify, okay, because you've got to give another amplitude for every possible configuration of all n of the bits. Okay, that is a staggering fact. It says that just to keep track of the states of, say, a thousand particles that nature off to the side somewhere has to, you know, keep like uh, uh, a slip of paper with two to the thousand slip, uh, uh, complex numbers, you know, and constantly update them. Okay, and this presents 
presents an obvious, you know, practical problem known for many decades uh, to people who try to use conventional computers to simulate quantum mechanics. Okay, you know, that you get an exponential slowdown with the number of particles. Okay, but, um, you know, so then finally, you know, in the 80s, you know, people like uh, uh, Deutsch and like Richard Feynman, you know, finally started saying, well, then, you know, why not just turn things around and build computers that themselves could exploit uh, principles of quantum superposition? Okay, well, what would such a computer be good for? Well, you know, at least one thing. It would be good for simulating quantum physics. Um, you know, now, as tautological as that sounds, I think that if we ever get practical quantum computers, actually simulating quantum physics will probably be the main thing that they're used for. Okay, because it's a huge application area for uh, drug design, for uh, um, uh, material science, for understanding high temperature superconductivity, uh, for lots and lots of other things. Okay, and it's something that a quantum computer does in its sleep. Okay, but of course, what really got everyone excited about this field was uh, Peter Shor's discovery in 1994 that a quantum computer could do uh, more than just simulating quantum physics, okay? And he showed that, um, in particular, it could uh, factor integers and, you know, take, calculate discrete logarithms in polynomial time, and thereby, as it happens, break almost all of the public key cryptography, which is currently used on the Internet. Okay, so various people got interested in quantum computing who, who hadn't been interested uh, before. Okay. Um, uh, so where are we now? Well, after, you know, uh, um, you know, like 18 years, about a billion dollars of funding in this field, you know, a quantum computer just recently uh, was reported to a factor 21 into 3 times 7 uh, with high statistical confidence. Uh, so, look, you know, uh, uh, you know, these are great physics experiments. In fact, you know, the Nobel Prize in physics was just given, you know, a month ago for these sorts of experiments. You know, scaling it up is really, really hard, uh, be again, because of decoherence because of the need to isolate the machine from its environment. However, unless quantum mechanics is wrong, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be any fundamental obstacle. On the contrary, we now know that if you can get the decoherence rate to some small but non-zero level, then there are these extremely clever quantum error correcting codes that can render the remaining effects of the decoherence insignificant. Okay? We're just so, you know, in the case of uh, uh, classical uh, computing, you know, it took more than a century from Charles Babbage to the invention of the transistor that finally made the idea practical, right? In the case of quantum computing, who knows how long it's going to take? Okay, but, you know, looks like it's possible in principle, right? If there's something wrong with quantum mechanics, or, you know, with the physics, of course, that's even more exciting. Then we'd be even happier, okay? That's definitely more Nobel Prizes, okay? <laughs> So, um, okay, but now one thing that I think is not appreciated nearly as much as it should be is that even if we had ideal quantum computers, they would still have significant limitations. So contrary to almost every popular article which has ever been written on this subject, a quantum computer would not let you try all answers in parallel and instantly pick the best one. That's not how it works. Sounds too good to be true, and it is. Okay, uh, here's the problem with that. Yes, you can make a superposition over all the possible answers, but then you have to measure at some point, right? And when you measure, you're just going to get a random answer where X, you know, will appear with like probability equal to the absolute square of the amplitude of X. Okay, and of course, if you just wanted a random answer, then you could have generated one yourself with much less trouble, okay? So, you know, if you want, if you have any, for any hope of getting a speed up, you need to exploit interference in order to get the different paths leading to a given wrong answer to sort of cancel each other out. So some have positive amplitudes, others have negative amplitudes, whereas the different paths that lead to the right answer should all reinforce each other. Okay, you know, that's, the, that's really the trick in any quantum computation. Okay, it's not obvious that it can be done, you know, Ever. Okay, it was an amazing discovery that it can be done for a few problems, for a few special problems, like factoring integers, you know, various other things in algebra, number theory, group theory, you know, uh, relevant to cryptography, uh, you know, to, to some other areas. Okay, but a crucial point is that the prevailing belief today is that NP is not contained in BQP. We're here, BQP means bounded error quantum polynomial time. That's the class of all the problems that are solved 
solvable efficiently by a quantum computer. Okay, so in other words, uh, we believe today that there's no polynomial time quantum algorithm to solve the NP-complete problems. Okay, in, in general, you know, and of course we can't prove that. You know, we can't even prove that classical computers can't solve these problems, right? That's the P versus NP problem. Okay, but it's the prevailing belief. Okay, so on what evidence? You know, you might ask. Uh, so, all right, an, an important result due to Bennett et al. said that if you have just a completely unstructured search problem, you know, involving n possible solutions, then you know, even a quantum computer, which is able to query all of the possible solutions in superposition. Okay, is going to need at least on the order of square root of n steps in order to find the you know a desired solution uh, with high probability. Okay, now that square root of n uh, bound actually turns out to be achievable using what's called Grover's algorithm, which is probably the second most famous quantum algorithm after Shor's. Okay, now so Grover's algorithm is you know has is extremely widely applicable. Okay, it lets you take any combinatorial search problem whatsoever, basically, and reduce the number of time, is reduce the number of steps needed to solve it by a square root factor from, for example, 2 to the n to 2 to the n over 2. Okay, but of course that's not, that doesn't change an exponential into a polynomial, right? That's a, a quadratic speed up. Okay, so now you might ask, okay, but could a quantum computer solve NP-hard optimization problems, for example, problems arising in machine learning uh, in polynomial time by exploiting the problem structure in the same way that a classical algorithm uh, would exploit their structure? Okay, well, if there's a famous attempt to do so, which is called the quantum adiabatic algorithm, which was proposed by my uh, colleagues in MIT physics, including Ed Farhi, um, over a decade ago. And uh, you can think of this algorithm as basically the quantum analog of simulated annealing. Okay, so it's like it's a heuristic algorithm, and it basically does sort of simulated annealing, but sort of enhanced by quantum tunneling effects. Okay, so if for those who know what this means, you start in some Hamiltonian, which is like an instantaneous time unitary transformation that has some known easily prepared ground state. Then you slowly transition it to a Hamiltonian whose ground state encodes the solution to your NP-complete problem. And there's a theorem that says that as long as you vary the Hamiltonian slowly enough, the uh, ground st the, the state of your quantum computer must just get tracked you know, along with the ground state. And so then at the end, you'll be able able to measure and get the solution to your NP-complete problem. Okay, the key, the million dollar question here is how slowly is slowly enough? All right, and here the problem is that, you know, the running, the time you need to run this algorithm for is determined by what's called the inverse eigenvalue gap of the Hamiltonian. Okay, and what you find when you try running this on, you know, hard, like, three sat instances, for example, and people have tried it both numerically and sort of analytically uh, for, you know, the, the last decade. Okay, you find that often the, uh, this eigenvalue gap, just at one little point, it becomes exponentially small. So it looks like the two eigenvalues are crossing each other, you know, they're not quite, okay, but, you know, beca you know, because of that one little place where these eigenvalues almost kiss, that's why you have to run the algorithm for exponential time, <laughs> okay, so far he told me the story that he once asked an expert in condensed matter physics, look, based on your experience, you know, over decades with all sorts of similar physical systems, do you think that this eigenvalue gap is going to decrease polynomially or exponentially as the size of the system increases? And this expert said, well, I think it will decrease exponentially. And, the, and Farhi said, well, why? What makes you say that? And the expert said, well, because otherwise your algorithm would work. <laughs> Okay, so you know if you believe strongly enough that NP-complete <laughs> problems are hard, you can reason backwards from that. But all right. Um, so what we know today is that on some fitness landscapes, the adiabatic algorithm can reach a global minimum exponentially faster than classical simulated annealing. But on other f types of fitness landscapes, it does about the same or even worse. To know what sort of behavior predominates in practice, well, it would help a lot to have a quantum computer to test it out with. Uh, now some of you might be saying, but isn't there this company that's, you know, already, you know, claims to have already built quantum computers that can, you know, run the uh, quantum adiabatic algorithm? Well, indeed there is, you know, it's called D-Wave Systems, you know, and they, they have these devices, right, and, you know, here's the situation. Uh, we know that their devices sort of can solve optimization problems on up to about 100 bits, you know, and in fact solve them reasonably well, you know, fairly quickly. We also know that at least at the one qubit level, there is some kind of quantum co 
coherence in D-Wave's devices. What we don't know at this point is whether the quantum coherence is playing any kind of causal role in speeding up the computation. In other words, it remains consistent with what we know today that what D-Wave has done is basically to build like a very fast, special purpose, classical computer for simulated annealing. Okay, now there's a group at USC which is currently running tests with this machine, and hopefully we'll know a lot more uh, in the near future about, you know, about uh, 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 its characterization. Okay, but for now, I'd say it remains, you know, so to speak, a black box. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, all right, as an aside, um, you know, you may wonder, can, um, uh, you know, is, is it actually true that, you know, as, as all the popular articles say, that n qubits can encode two to the n power classical bits? Well, you know, that's the number of bits that you would need to describe the state of n qubits, but, you know, the number of bits that you can actually read out by measuring the qubits may be much, much smaller than that. Okay, and in fact, you know, I was able to use some machine learning type of ideas to show that in certain, you know, um, um, operational senses, a quantum state of n qubits behaves effectively like it has only a polynomial number of bits rather than an exponential number. Okay, so here's uh, one theorem that I... That, that I proved, uh, that says, given any n qubit state psi, suppose that you only care about psi's behavior on two outcome measurements in some finite set S. Okay, then there exists a subset of those measurements, call it T, of a very small size, only n log n measurements, such that basically if you did a training process where you sort of started with the maximally ignorant guess about what psi was, and then you post-selected on your state giving you the right answers on all the measurements in the set T, you know, on all n log n of them, then you would end up with a state that approximately simulates the behavior of psi, your desired state, on all the measurements in, in, uh, in, the, in the entire set S. Okay, so what does, you know, and the idea of the proof is to use a Darwinian sort of training process similar to boosting. So you repeatedly find a measurement where your current guess is still badly wrong, even conditioned on being right on all the previous guesses. Okay, and then, you know, if you condition on being right on that new example, then sort of you, mu you know, you must learn something, right? And if there's no, you know, example where you're badly wrong, then you're done. Right? And, you know, and then you prove a bound by using the linearity of quantum mechanics on the number of you know, training steps you would have to go through before you, know, you must have a state that, you know, that, that, that works for everything. Okay, um, you know, well, what, what this means is that we can describe the behavior of an n qubit state psi, you know, on well enough to sort of reproduce, you know, the, the probability that you're going to get a yes, you know, under two to the n different measurements, and we can do that, you know, using just a summary with only n squared log n classical bits. It's a polynomial number of classical bits. Okay, so when we ask this sort of question, you know, quantum states sort of, you know, seem to shrink down to size in some way. Um, you know, now, uh, later I proved another theorem, which, you know, is even more directly sort of a, a machine learning flavor. It says, given an n qubit state psi, suppose you only care about its behavior on two outcome measurements that are drawn from some probability distribution D. Okay, then what you could do is draw some sample measurements, m1 up to mk, you know, independently from D, and the number of such measurements only has to be linear, not exponential, with the number of qubits. Okay, so L of n sample measurements. Then find any hypothesis state, phi, that approximately agrees with psi, your target state, on all of those sample measurements. Okay, and then one can prove that with high probability over the choice of sample measurements, that phi must also approximately simulate the behavior of psi on most measurements drawn from the entire distribution. Okay, and the proof idea is to use the notion of fat shattering dimension from learning theory. You, show, you consider like the class of all quantum states as a hypothesis class. You use quantum information ideas, again based on quantum mechanical linearity, to show to upper bound the fat shattering dimension of quantum states. You know, and this uh, could have some actual applications in uh, quantum state tomography because this gives you, in other words, characterizing an unknown quantum state given a lot of independent copies of it. Okay, because this it says if you only care about predicting the outcomes of most measurements, then you can reduce the amount of sample data that you need from exponential to linear.
Okay, uh, so um, you know this was just you know a, a theorem, but uh, uh, um, a few uh, years ago I actually worked with a student, uh, Eyal Dechter, who's here, and uh, uh, he actually uh, implemented this quantum state you know learning process in MATLAB, and we tried it out on various simulated examples, and you know the result of these uh, numerical experiments is that uh, my theorem appears to be true. So uh, the uh, you know indeed the sample complexity only uh, grows linearly with the uh, the no with the the uh, number of qubits, and in fact, you know, and the constants are perfectly reasonable as well. Okay, the one last thing I want to mention is uh, the no cloning theorem. This is the principle that says that there is no physical procedure to copy an unknown quantum state. Okay, and the reason for that is simply that if you write out algebraically what cloning of a quantum state would mean, you know, you find that it acts quadratically in the amplitudes. Okay, but that's not allowed. Unitary transformations have to be linear. Okay, and um, so, you know, this makes quantum information hugely different from classical information. You know, you've heard that information wants to be free, right, but quantum information wants to be private in some sense, okay? Uh, you know, it's closely related to the uncertainty principle, which says, you know, you can't simultaneously measure both the position and the momentum of a particle to unlimited precision. You know, the two imply each other, actually. Uh, you know, now there have been some amazing applications of the no cloning theorem uh, to quantum information. Uh, you know, one is quantum key distribution. So Alice and Bob can do cryptography by sending photons, you know, sending qubits down a fiber optic cable. And if an eavesdropper, say Eve, you know, tries to measure uh, the qubits, then Alice and Bob will actually be able to detect that their qubits have, have been tampered with and therefore abort the protocol. This is already practical. Okay? You can buy devices now that will implement quantum key distribution. I don't know how much market there is, but, you know. Um, so, so, you know, a more speculative thing is quantum money, where you would have uh, some qubits attached to each uh, dollar bill, let's say, uh, you know, s such that, you know, a, uh, um, the, the bank that printed the uh, bills could authenticate a state as genuine by measuring the qubits, okay, but someone who who didn't know how the qubits were prepared would be physically unable to copy a bill. Okay, because, you know, again, because of the no cloning theorem. Okay, recently with Paul Christiana, we showed that under some cryptographic assumptions, you can even get quantum money that can be verified by anyone, not only the bank. Okay, and then one, another thing that Cristiano and I are now working on is quantum copy-protected software, quantum DRM. So you would get some state psi, sorry, sorry, some state psi sub f that, you know, but, you know, it's not, don't worry, it's not going to be practical for a long time. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's a state size of f lets you evaluate some function f on inputs x of your choice, but that you would not be able to efficiently use to learn the function f or indeed to prepare any more states with which f could be evaluated. And we actually think that this can be done in general now. Okay. So, all right, but now let me ask in my remaining few minutes, is quantum mechanics relevant to biology? Okay, well, at a small enough scale, you know, we now know the answer is certainly yes, right? That shouldn't be such a surprise because, you know, at a small enough scale, everything is quantum mechanical. Okay, but there have been some really, you know, cool recent papers saying that, for example, uh, green plant photosynthesis, right? The reason why it's able to be as efficient as it is at harvesting photons, you know, fundamentally has to do with a coherent quantum optical effect. Okay, and people are now working on reverse engineering that so that, you know, maybe they could eventually design solar cells that would have similar efficiencies. Okay, uh, uh, European robins and, and various other birds have this amazing, you know, ability to navigate by internal compasses, okay? And it's, you know, over the last decade, it's been discovered that, you know, the way their, their internal compasses work is by measuring the um, uh, magnetic field gradient between two entangled electrons, okay? So, you know, this robin uses quantum information. So, you know, why not us? Right. Okay. Well, you know, now let's ask, you know, so is, could quantum mechanics be relevant to the brain? So, you know, there are three proposals that I've seen for how it could conceivably be relevant. It's important to keep them uh, separate. Okay. The first proposal would be that the brain is literally a quantum computer, that it can run the quantum adiabatic algorithm or Shor's algorithm or, or whatever. Okay. The second would be, you know, this old idea that the collapse of the wave function somehow has to do with consciousness. Consciousness. And the third proposal would be that there are quantum mechanical limits on the physical predictability of the brain. Okay, so to cut to the chase, I am going to argue that uh, based on our current understanding, uh, the first two of these possibilities uh, can be pretty strongly rejected. Uh, the third, I have no idea. 
And in fact, I think it's a one, you know, it opens up wonderful uh, possible avenues for research. Okay, so could the brain be a quantum computer? Well, we've already discussed that idea as physical implausibility. Okay, but now you know, I want to make a different point, which is that you know, even you know, if you forgot about the physics, there are other severe problems with this idea that I think are just as important. The first is that we now know a lot, as I told you, about the sorts of things that a quantum computer would be good for. Okay, factoring integers, uh, discrete logarithms, uh, um, simulating quantum field theory, you know, uh, maybe some kind of small speed ups for combinat modest speed ups for combinatorial optimization problems. Okay, well, you know, at least you know, with the possible exception of the of the last, none of these are things that you know had obvious survival value in the African savanna. Uh, it's not clear why we would have evolved these these abilities, right? Uh, you know, maybe more to the point, you know, I don't see any evidence that humans do solve problems like factoring integers or simulating quantum physics efficiently. Okay, I mean. Yes, humans do seem amazingly good at certain types of problems, but you know, but the things that we're good at are just not at all a good fit for you know to the things that we've discovered that a quantum computer you know would would be good at or would give us a speed up for. Okay. Uh, thirdly, you know, even supposing that the brain were a quantum computer, sort of, I wonder how that would help at all with sort of the mystery of consciousness that presumably motivated the suggestion, right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, like the, if we talk about like this millennia-old mind-body problem, right? It's not clear to me how you are going to bridge the gap between mind and body with a hardware upgrade, okay, uh, which is really what we're talking about here, right? And, you know, this is like, you know, a very common objection that's been made, for example, to Roger Penrose's ideas, right? Even supposing it's right, you know, it still doesn't seem to explain consciousness. Okay, so could conscious, you know, could uh, uh, consciousness be needed for the collapse of the wave function? Well, if you wanted to believe that, then here is what you would have to believe. Okay, you'd have to believe that, you know, the Big Bang, the universe has some quantum state. Okay, then for 13.7 billion years, it evolves via unitary evolution, you know, um, no measurement anywhere in sight. And then, you know, the Earth cools, you know, and then finally, you know, a human evolves, or maybe it's a monkey or something, right? And they, and they look around, and then that just suddenly and violently collapses the universe's quantum state. Okay, well, this is, uh, uh, not, uh, I think, an absurdity. So, you know, my conclusion is that if collapse is a physical phenomenon at all, if you want to believe it is, then you have to also believe that it's something that can happen all over the place, in the interiors of stars or whatever, triggered by some physical conditions that we don't know yet, okay, even with no conscious observers for light years around. You know, otherwise, I think we get nonsense. Okay, but now what about quantum limits on predictability? This will be my last thing. All right, well, let's consider faxing yourself to another planet, like in Star Trek, okay? So, you know, you go into the brain scanner, scans your brain, you know, that's Lake Tahoe, that's Mars, uh, you know, you, you end up over there, okay? Uh, you know, it sounds great, you know, why, why can't we have it? Okay, well, um, you know, if you're going to do this, you know, one thing to, it's important, remember to, you know, have the original copy of yourself painlessly euthanized. Okay, or else, you know, if you leave it alive, right, who knows which one you're going to wake up as. <laughs> right, maybe you'll wake up as the original copy. Okay, or, you know, maybe you want to keep a backup copy of yourself, right, but, you know, with ten backups of you running around, right, how, you know, how do you know which one you are? How do you even make, you know, Bayesian predictions in, in, in such a world? Okay, so, you know, you start thinking about these puzzles, which philosophers love to talk about, you know, there's a whole huge literature on these things, and you start scratching your head over all these, these you know, bizarre puzzles, and you start thinking, you know, uh, wouldn't it be great if there were some sort of principle of non-clonability that prevented this sort of metaphysical craziness from ever rearing its head? You say, wait a minute. You know, and then you say, well, such a principle might also prevent Deutsch's many worlds experiment from, you know, being performed with a human subject, right? If you can't sort of read out the classical state of something, then, you know, you may also not be able to put it in a coherent superposition of two states. Okay, so the question is the following. Does the no cloning theorem actually put interesting limits on our ability to, put, to copy the cognitively relevant information in a brain? And I think that there's like a spectrum of scientific opinion on this question, which ranges from, you know, obviously not. Look, you know, we already have fMRI scanners. You know, it should just take the engineers, you know, another 50 years, maybe 100, in order to invent nanorobots that could swarm through your brain and, you know, and scan the, uh, the 
the, the strength of every synapse, you know, and, and just and, and, and then download everything to a computer. So, you know, you could then make copies of yourself. Okay, this is at least this is what my friends in the singularity movement tell me. Okay. Uh, the other side of the spectrum is people who say, well, cloning a brain is obviously impossible, even just for classical reasons, ignoring quantum mechanics. I heard someone say that, you know, using the no cloning theorem to, you know, um, to argue for the unclonability of the brain is like, you know, hiring the world's most high powered lawyer to get you out of a parking ticket. Okay. But, um, you know, so a crucial question here is, well, what exactly counts as the cognitively relevant information? You know, does it include only the sort of macro information about the neurons or, you know, does it include like the quantum states of the individual sodium ion channels and so forth? I mean, that's partly a philosophical question, but I think partly also an empirical one because, you know, like you might never know that you had copied all the, you know, the, the, the needed information, but you might know for sure that you hadn't copied it. If your model was totally, you know, badly miscalibrated and didn't predict the original person well at all. Okay, so, um, Here's a quote by, from Niels Bohr. Uh, he says, we should doubtless kill an animal if we tried to carry the investigation of its organs so far that we could tell the part played by the single atoms in vital functions. The idea suggests itself that the minimal freedom we must allow the organism will be just large enough to permit it, so to say, to hide its ultimate secrets from us. So my proposal is simply that neuroscientists and machine learning folks should treat Bohr's claim as fighting words. They should see how far it can be falsified. Okay, as to some extent, of course, in crude ways, people already have. So, you know, you can look at these experiments like Libet's that look at this, you know, look for this readiness potential that says, you know, you're about to flick your finger, you know, up to maybe a second before you do it. And today, I think using fMRI, they can predict it with about 60 or 70 percent probability. On the other hand, you may be able to predict that just using machine learning with no brain scan needed, right? So that's, you know, a pretty weak kind of prediction, right? And, you know, how strong can you get the prediction? Right, how well can you trace a decision to, you know, this firing of this neuron, this opening of this sodium ion channel, and so forth? I think those are great questions. So, in conclusion, you know, several speculations that one hears, for example, that the brain is a quantum computer or that its activity is needed for wave function collapse, I think are profoundly implausible, and not only on physical and biological grounds, but on logical and computational grounds as well. Okay, by contrast, the question of the fundamental physical limits of biological prediction, like is the no-cloning theorem ever relevant, seems fascinating to me and underexplored. And unlike with a lot of these sort of big questions, you know, here I think that there's a serious prospect that progress in neuroscience and physics and machine learning could actually tell us more. So thank you. Derandomization. Yep. And a standard argument against derandomization is that random numbers are physically... Um, easily available, that we can mm -hmm. amplify quantum noise and, yep. and make physically random number generators. Is the last question, you know, can we predict the brain, mm -hmm. um, simply a question of are we using physically random number generators and random algorithms, and if, yeah. is that an interesting, really, question? Yeah, so, so, so a lot of people ask this question, right, and a lot of people have made the point, which I think is completely valid, right, that if you had, like, a way that you could predict the probabilities, you know, by, of, you know that a, a person would take any action, you know, in the same sense that sort of you know, you could predict the probabilities for a radioactive atom, right? Then this is not, you know, free will in the sense that most people would, you know, would mean by that or in some metaphysical sense, right? So, so I think that, you know, if you can actually get sort of well-calibrated and sort of informative probabilistic predictions, and if you can trace, for, if you can furthermore trace the source of the probabilistic noise to, you know, okay, it's coming from, you know, this, you know, uh, uh, you know, stochastic element or, you know, this quantum mechanical element, right, that, you know, we, like in quantum mechanics, we have excellent arguments why it must be real randomness. It can't be pseudo-randomness, or else you would need faster than light communication, right? That's what the Bell inequality basically tells you, okay? So, you know, so there we know that, okay, there's a reason why we're never going to get further than making these probabilistic predictions. Okay, at that point, I would say that you have understood everything about this system that it's possible to understand, right? I would be completely happy to agree about that. So my question is simply, can you get to that point? You know, even getting well calibrated probabilistic predictions, right? Or are you, go you know, always going to stay in a situation of like of nighty and uncertainty? I guess as the economists call it, or even your predict your probabilities are not well calibrated. Any other questions? Uh, my concern is about trying to build an artificial machine 
which is conscious mm -hmm. and intelligent. Uh, if you are going to make this machine work using pseudo-random numbers, these numbers are not really random. Yeah. So do you think you would need some kind of uh, quantum random number generator mm -hmm. for the machine? And in that way, I mean uh, plugging the random number generator to the real world, for example, mm -hmm. taking the uh, seats, uh, the seat numbers from, say, I don't know, like the uh, static on your TV screen, mm -hmm. for example, or mm -hmm. some yeah. antenna or whatever. Yeah. So, okay, so, so, so I have no idea, first of all, right? But I think that there was a Futurama episode based on this where, you know, Bender only acquires free will by plugging a quantum random number generator into his, uh, into his forehead, right? But uh, uh, so, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the issue is uh, that uh, we... Um, uh, you know, if if you had you know like a you know something that that sort of was deterministic except for a random number generator that it's sometimes called, for example, you know, then regardless of whether that was a truly random or pseudo random, right? Then you know you could you know an external agent could sort of form a perfectly accurate sort of model of you know everything that that agent is going to do, right? And so so you you would be in the situation where you would have uh, you know an like a, a an entity, right, that may be able to pass the Turing test and so forth, but only if you don't know its code, right? And, you know, and, and someone could easily scan it and, you know, get its code, and then, you know, to that person, you know, it wouldn't look, it would no longer look like a sort of uh, like a mind at all. It would, you know, look like a mechanism, right, to someone who, to someone who knew the code. Okay, and so the question, the sort of empirical question here, if you like, is sort of can the code, you know, for us be read out? So here's a possible challenge for machine learning yes. coming from quantum mechanics. Tell yes. me if it makes any sense. Sure. Uh, say uh, decoherence is just a property of a sufficiently large number of correlated variables. Yep. Right? If you get enough of them, then it decoheres. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the problem is that we don't actually have the math or the capability right now to understand or predict or prove that that happens. But that's maybe where something like machine learning and probabilistic reasoning mm -hmm. might, might help. Huh. Well, okay, well I, mean, I think I mentioned in the talk there are lots of applica possible applications for machine learning ideas to you know all sorts of issues in quantum information, right? So I think that you know at the rough mathematical level, decoherence is fairly well understood, right? There's been a whole theory of it that's been developed over the last 40 years. You know now whether machine learning ideas could contribute. I mean, you know, one place where they certainly have contributed is like you know, understanding you know how do you do tomography of a quantum state, right? How do you characterize what the quantum state of your system system is, how do you prove that there was really entanglement there so that you can publish your paper in Nature or whatever, right? You know, these are issues where I think machine learning has already played a role and where it could play an even bigger role in the future. Okay, let's thank this figure again. Rather than thinking of uh, the kind of work that we do as the paranormal or the supernatural or spooky, this or that, what we're really talking about here is what is the role of consciousness in the physical world? And this is a tough problem because science doesn't yet know what consciousness is. The nature of awareness is a major mystery. No one knows. And it's also recursive, as illustrated here by this drawing, that it's, it, this is the act of consciousness, like what's going on, the awareness in your head, trying to understand itself. That is a recursion problem, and it's extremely difficult to figure out, which is why we don't know what it is yet. So what I'm going to, I'm talking then about uh, the role of consciousness in the physical world. That's the way that I think about the program that we're doing, which is in basically the physics of consciousness. And when we get our slides back, you'll see that the way that we can begin to think about this from a scientific perspective is that it doesn't involve things coming out of your head. The usual way people think about what, how is it possible that your mind can influence the world around you without actually pushing it with your fingers. The, the first thing that people think of is that there's some kind of force that comes out of your head. And this has actually been checked. People have looked for forces for many, many years, and no forces are ever found. We see effects. We see that your intention can change the world, but not force-like. Well, what else is going on then? Let's see if we can go to the next. So one possibility is uh, that there's something about the brain that is at work here. There are conscious and unconscious elements of the brain. Uh, maybe we have other kinds of bodies. There are many traditions, esoteric traditions, that talk about a physical body and a light body and other kinds of bodies. 
Uh, and ultimately, we want, to, we want to know, if you change your thoughts, can you indeed change your world? So Rajiv told us that uh, in his own story that he would like to do something and then magically it suddenly happens. Well, is that coincidence or is there something actually happening in the world? There are two major theories that go on here. The first one is the neuroscience theory, which basically says that you're nothing but a pack of neurons or that you're a machine made of meat. Well, surgeons know that we are a machine made of meat. It's all about putting the machine back together again, but that doesn't tell us what consciousness is. Nevertheless, within the neurosciences, this is the prevailing theory, that your sense of self, your consciousness, everything you think subjectively is a result of your brain activity, and that's the end of the story. But there is another theory, one of much older theory, by the way, I'm, we'll call this mechanistic materialism, which is the scientific worldview. It's very successful. We can't exclude this as a possibility because it is so successful. But the second theory is this, that consciousness is fundamental in some way that we don't yet understand yet from a, from a scientific perspective. So what do we do then? We have stories of mind-matter interaction. Is it simply entertainment? It's superstition? It's magical thinking? Or is it something else? Well, that's the task at hand. It turns out that there have been many experiments over the years, both on living systems and also non-living systems. Uh, these are about 100 years old now, from, from about 100 years till today. Roughly 500 publications in peer-reviewed journals and about 2,000 experiments have been reported. One of the first was actually described by Sir Francis Bacon, who was one of the founders of modern empiricism. His idea, written in this famous book, A Natural History in 10 Centuries, was that if you wanted to study, as he put it, the force of imagination, which by which he means intention. You want to study the role of intention in the physical world? How do you do that? You toss dice. Why? Because with, with dice you can use statistics, and remember this is 1627, it was already coming up with ways of testing whether or not your mind could influence the world at large. So 300 years goes by, and here's J.B. Ryan at Duke University doing experiments with dice. And of course, you can't give somebody dice and have them toss it because there are ways of faking. You can make certain numbers come up if you hold the dice. So he used machines to toss the dice. So this kind of experimentation went on for 50 years, roughly 1935, 1987. What you're looking at at 50% would be a chance result that people could not influence the dice. But as you see, the means on this are mostly above 50%, and the overall result is there. And you can see the error bars. So this is way above chance. And in fact, you do the statistics on it. I did a meta-analysis a number of years ago. So when you look at all of the studies weighted by quality, the odds against chance is a gazillion to one. So people with many, many, many repeated trials and independent experiments show that you can indeed affect the roll of dice. This doesn't mean that the casinos are in trouble because the house take in casino games is so much greater than the effect size here that all the, the very worst that they're going to do is lose a little bit less, uh, or actually you will end up losing slower than you would if you were not using your intention. So the casinos have nothing to worry about. In fact, the casinos like this kind of information because it gives people the idea that maybe they could win simply by willing it, and most people, that's not gonna happen. So, uh, another long-term experiment using physical objects, this is um, Bob John and Brenda Dunn from Princeton University who had a lab that went almost 30 years. And one of their experiments used this big device, it's about 10 feet tall, it had 3,000 little polystyrene balls in it. And the polystyrene balls would fall down through pegs and they would create a normal curve at the bottom. And your task, that's what the, the thing looked like, this is what uh, the different bins at the bottom look like after many, many thousands of control runs. It looks supposed to be a normal curve and it's very, very close to normal, but you ask somebody while the balls are falling down to slightly push them to the right with your mind. In fact, they got pushed to the right. You push them to the left, they move to the left. And when you're not trying to do anything, they stay in the middle. So this is statistically speaking a very significant result. In terms of how much the magnitude was, it's not like you could see it happening, you could only see it statistically, but with enough data you can see that there is actually an effect going on. So how is it possible? Do we have force beams coming out of our head? 
as illustrated in the comic books, this is the way we think of it. There's light, lightning strikes out of your head. It makes housework a snap. So how, how do we begin to even understand this? Up until recently, there wasn't any explanation. One of the reasons that this kind of research was considered out on the fringe somewhere is not through the empiricism, because there's plenty of data. It is completely uh, uh, a question about how do you begin to answer this in a scientific way without having to develop entirely new kinds of ideas. So in order to answer this question, we need to leave our senses. And what I mean by that is that common sense is, the, is not going to answer the question. Our common sense is an extremely thin slice of the world at large. And if there's one thing that science has taught us over the years is that what you perceive with your eyes and, and the, with your body and so on, that's a very, very small part of the world. And it's one of the reasons why it took the germ theory of disease basically a century before people understood that maybe you should wash your hands before you eat or do surgery. It took a long time because people could not see the germs. So there are many aspects of the world that are way beyond our ability, our common sense ability, and it's only through the development of instruments that we're able to actually see things that the world is much larger than we, th than we thought. So we will now leave our senses. We're interested in studying the nature of consciousness and awareness. You can think of this, not consciousness in the large sense, but simply what does it mean to be aware? Where does that come from? Well, taking a scientific approach, we try to find the source of it, which seems to be inside your head. We, go to, we start using reductionism, and we look at neurons, we look at the, the synapses. We go further down, you find DNA, and then you find uh, atoms and, or molecules, atoms, below atoms. Uh, you start to find quarks. And then you ask, well, what is a quark? A quark ultimately is a mathematical construct. No one has ever actually seen a quark. It's a construct. So what is this mathematical construct all about? It's basically stuff in your head. It's symbolic. It's things that your head made up. So we have this strange recursion. We're trying to understand the nature of awareness, and when you cycle all the way around using the scientific method, you end up all the way back inside the mind. It's, it's symbolism. And it's actually worse than that, because when you start asking what is the, f the foundations of mathematics, it's set theory. And what's the foundation of set theory is the Aleph null, or the null set. And so you start from awareness, and you go all the way down to literally nothing. So this is why uh, Kurt Vonnegut said, everything is nothing with a twist. Or, if you prefer, when I press this button, at first there was nothing, then it exploded. So this is one of the consequences and actually demonstrates the difficulty of trying to understand these kinds of phenomena, especially consciousness. So uh, we're talking here primarily about the difference between or the boundary between the classical and the quantum domains. So as you go further and further down into the structure of matter, you find that the world starts to get very, very strange indeed. In the classical world, we're used to things like locality, which means that if you want something to move, you have to shove it. You have to physically push it. Strict causality means time only flows in one direction, and absolute reality means that the moon is there if you're not looking. It means that objects have real properties. None of that is true in the quantum domain. In the quantum domain, things operate non-locally, that you don't need any contact at all in order to have influences at a distance, that causality is only probable, which means you can have things go backwards in time, and that reality is only potential that objects actually don't exist in the usual way of thinking of objects until they are measured or observed. There are no properties at all. So it's very difficult for us to think about what it is, what it's like down in the quantum world, which, by the way, is right here and right now. We are in it. We just don't perceive it very well. But it's, it's the fundamentals of the physical world that we're in. One of the other strange things, of course, is that elementary particles have, have multiple characteristics, waves and particles both. In, the, in the, our common sense world, it would be something like that. You could ski right through uh, a tree. So you take a little uh, machine that shoots little pellets, and you send the pellets through two slits. And uh, when you do that, you see many of them bounce off because they don't go through the slits. But the ones that do go end up with two slits on the other side. This is the famous double slit experiment. 
That's what would happen if you use things about the size of a pellet. But if you use electrons or photons or elementary particles, you don't get two stripes, you get a series of stripes. This is called an interference pattern, and this has been a major mystery. It's a way of demonstrating in a physics lab that elementary particles are both waves and particles. This, of course, works also if you send in one particle at a time. You send one electron or one photon at a time through two slits, you will end up with an interference pattern. This is the way of demonstrating that while the particle is there, it's a separate little object apparently, but it also has wave-like characteristics. So what do we do now? We physicists have looked at this for many years and they decided that what they're seeing is the wave-like characteristic of matter and, and energy, both. And the dark bars here is what happens when you get constructive and destructive interference with waves. And so this is the reason why in the double slit experiment you have the alternating light and dark bars, just like it shows here. So with that in hand, uh, what we're actually happening in these kinds of experiments with double slits is that we're shooting probability waves. So it's no longer that profitable to think in terms of particles, but waves of probability or waves of possibility. This gave rise to Schrodinger's wave equation. You think of the deep physical reality as a series of possibilities rather than actualities. And that's the equation, and that has been estimated to account for roughly 30% of the world's economy. The quantum mechanics is uh, the basis of our communications, of our electronics, and so on. That is the best physical theory that we've ever had. So far, of the many experiments done to look at it, none of them have failed. So that, that seems to be the way the world is, even though common sense doesn't show the world that way, that is what's happening. And the, the, the part of it where we bring it back into the role of intention is this, that if you're not looking at a double slit experiment or you're not measuring the nature of the physical world, it behaves in the way that we just saw it, that you get an interference pattern because it's wave-like. But the moment that you do look, it no longer behaves that way. It behaves like particles. So this immediately tells us there's something peculiar about the role of measurement or observation in quantum mechanics. That if you can see or get actually any information at all about the deep physical structure, it acts like particles, otherwise it doesn't. So this is a major mystery in physics. But it's relevant, I think, to, as you'll see here, here's the same double slit experiment using, uh, in this case, photons. But we're going to look. From a distance, we'll look and we'll see which of the two slits does a photon go through. And when you do that, you see you end up with two bars. It's acting like particles. So this gives, gave me an idea of how we'd go about testing this. And other people have thought of this as well. It's related to the, what's called the quantum measurement problem. This is an unsolved problem in physics. And the problem is that you have some kind of a quantum system on the left, and you have some sort of a measuring apparatus, which could be your eye, it could be uh, an instrument of some type, and when you measure the quantum system, you entangle it. The mathematics, you do something called a tensor product, and you, all you, that you've done is created a more complex quantum system as a result of the measurement. So the system and the apparatus are no longer independent, they're now entangled. Well, I assume many of you have heard of quantum entanglement, but in essence, what it means is that if you have systems that interact and then they separate, they're no longer separate. They might seem to be separate, but they're really not. They share properties. So observation apparently collapses, so-called the quantum wave function. It makes the potential world into the physical world that we see. And that means uh, it raises this question of when does the wave function collapse during measurement? You have a kind of quantum system there on the left. You measure it in some way, maybe using a photodiode. And then you measure it again, looking through your glasses. And so when does this stop becoming wave-like and turn into particle-like, into the world that we see? And the answer seems to be it has something to do with consciousness. And this is one interpretation of quantum mechanics, there are many others. But this one actually has a, a pretty strong uh, background in terms of who is proposing it. So here, for example, uh, this is uh, Eugene Wigner, a Nobel laureate physicist, who said that the very study of the physical world leads to the conclusion that the concept of consciousness 
is an ultimate reality. It follows that the being with a consciousness much have a different role in quantum mechanics than the inanimate object. So this is one person who said this about 50 years ago. And then somebody says, but aren't quantum effects so fragile that they can't have anything to do with living systems? And my Simpsons character, uh, Doppelganger, says, that's so 20th century. It's not true anymore. Why not? Because of the dawn of quantum biology. So older physicists for many, many years had said that quantum mechanics can't possibly have anything to do with consciousness or the brain or the body because we're too hot and we're too wet and you can't sustain quantum coherence, which is where all these strange quantum things come from. Younger physicists said, maybe that's true, maybe that's not true. So we're gonna look in, in living systems anyway, and it turns out that living systems not only have quantum effects, they require them in order to work the way that they do. So this is a new hot area of, of biology and physics, integrating both of them. And then the, uh, just very recently, we can turn up the weirdness. So you notice here that the, the, the knob here is, uh, goes up to 11 now on weirdness. And the reason is that there, as quantum entanglement is being studied primarily for use in quantum computing, new things are being learned. So this just came out a couple of weeks ago in New Scientist as a cover story, and this will explain it. Reality can be strange, especially at the smallest scales. But what causes it to be that way? Physicists used to pin it on quantum entanglement. But there may be a deeper source, quantum discord. When two photons are entangled, they share a sort of information link. Each has information about the other, and when that information changes, like when one of the photons is measured, that new information is reflected in the other photon, almost instantaneously. Any noise coming in from the outside removes information from the connection, until there's not enough left to maintain the link. But it turns out that entanglement is only one kind of connection that particles in the quantum world can have. Quantum discord is another. If entanglement is a perfect link, discord is a less than perfect link. It doesn't carry as much information, but still lets quantum particles interact in ways that classical particles can't. The more discord a system has, the stronger its quantum behavior, while a system with no discord behaves classically, with no quantum effects. So the amount of discord is what determines the quantumness of a system. And when two particles are linked by discord, it becomes possible to change one by manipulating the other. This means discord might be useful for things like quantum computers, which until now have relied on delicate entanglement to work. Quantum discord is more fundamental than entanglement, and scientists are only beginning to understand exactly how it gives rise to all the strangeness of the quantum world. But one thing seems clear, discord is more than just a way to link quantum particles. It's one of the rules that govern the most basic levels of reality. So this is very important. Quantum discord is more fundamental than quantum entanglement. It reveals that there are degrees of entanglement and that it's robust. This is not a fragile or a fleeting effect. It could be, it's here like all the time. Things are connected all the time to various degrees. And it's probably much more pervasive that we have quantum effects among us now that we're, we're only vaguely aware of but must be there. And for those of you who know about information theory, quantum discord basically is talking about mutual information. It's the sharing of informational structures between separate systems. This suggests to us that maybe when we're starting to think of this, does the observer really play an important role in fundamental physics? This is really the essence of the question of how could intention push the world around? Well, let's look at that in a little more detail. So we asked the experts. Now we're talking about experts who are physicists or philosophers or scientists who are interested in quantum mechanics. What do they think about this? It turns out that virtually all of the founders of quantum mechanics thought that the observer played an important role. And so this is roughly in the 1920s. It also is true in the 1950s. The leaders of quantum mechanics then too thought that there was something important about the observer that was it wrapped into quantum mechanics in some way and also in the bottom two physicists are contemporary physicists who accept this as well. Even more interesting is at a conference in 2011, 
the people who were present were specialists in the ontological foundations of quantum mechanics, meaning what the, well, how do we interpret what the quantum world is telling us about the world that we live in? And they were asked the question, how important do you think the observer is? So one answer was it's a complex system. It should play no fundamental role whatsoever. It does play a fundamental role in the application of the formalism or plays a distinguished physical role. And the majority of people said it plays a fundamental role. And this, this is reflecting of what does the mainstream say? The majority of the mainstream say, yeah, observation is extremely important to quantum mechanics, and that's where the door opens just the crack for a way to understand how intention influences the world at large. Another conference in 2013, specifically for people interested in quantum theory without observers. So these are people who think physics has nothing to do with observers or consciousness or anything else. The same questions are asked, and a quarter of the people at that conference also agreed, even though it was a conference about no observers, observers are important. So how would you go about testing for quantum level mind matter interactions? Not things like levitation and spoon bending, but actual effects of mind on matter at the quantum level. Well, this has been done now since the 1960s using quantum sources. The first one uh, was using radioactive decay, which is a quantum source. Most of the rest of them use Zener diodes, which I'll explain in a minute. They're using a property of, uh, called quantum tunneling. So these are different random number generators that use quantum events. Uh, the, the last couple here are commercial devices. The one that you can get now for about $50 is called uh, True RNG, and it's just a little uh, USB stick. It produces random numbers and based on quantum events, so considered to be truly random. So a Zener diode is based on quantum tunneling. Quantum tunneling uh, can be metaphorically described like this. If you have a classical ball and you get a, a certain shove to get it over a hill, that you need a certain amount of energy to have the ball go over the hill. And if you don't provide enough energy, the ball simply won't get there. For a quantum ball, though, quantum phenomena also have wave-like properties, and waves aren't stopped by things like hills. So you can just poke it a little bit, and it could just tunnel right through. It just teleports right through the hill. So that's a quantum phenomena on the right. That's how these random number generators work. They're based on quantum tunneling effects. So we do the following experiment. We take a random number generator. This is a true random system based on quantum uh, tunneling. All it knows how to do is create a series of zeros and ones, truly random. And so it creates a random walk. We give somebody a task to uh, aim high, to think thoughts high, to make the whole thing produce more ones than zeros, and to do this. So if it, that might be a result of an experiment, and that would be a success. They're trying to get more ones. And you repeatedly do this experiment. You tell them to aim high or aim low, and you see what does the random generator do. So that's one experiment. Well, this is the result of 12 years of this ex same experiment involving many, many people at Princeton University. And that's the result. There are, people are asked to aim high. The devices produce more ones. And to aim low, produce more zeros. And to do nothing stays in the middle. So this involved many people, many years, but one laboratory. So when I was at Princeton, I worked with a, a colleague to see if other laboratories had been able to replicate this, and we found many examples where they could. We published a meta-analysis in Foundations of Physics, and then later we, did the, we updated it and found almost 800 studies doing almost exactly the same experiment. You're trying to aim high or aim low, looking purely at the role of intention or will on a random event supposedly random event, which it turns out doesn't behave quite so randomly when you're thinking about it. So the odds against chance overall here is, is a gazillion, a multiple gazillion to one. It shows very clearly that when you ask people to simply will that a physical system over there somewhere should behave in a different way than by chance that it does. The magnitude of the effect is really, really small. It is not big enough to allow you to levitate. It is not big enough to allow you to levitate a flea, or even a, a baby flea. It's, we're talking down at the quantum scale, but nevertheless, it's a real effect. Uh, some uh, skeptical colleagues of mine in, uh, in Germany in 2006 again did a meta-analysis for a subset of these experiments, and they again found 
results that were significantly different than chance. So the, these are, for those of you who know about statistics, these are z-scores. So about uh, eight years ago now, I decided to bite the bullet and say, well, look, we, we know that the double slit experiment is the primary way of demonstrating the wave particle duality of light, and we can do an experiment where we ask people to make believe that their mind could act as a detector in this system, but at a distance. So people are simply asked to imagine that they could see the photons go through the double slit, and if the mind acts as a detector, then it will collapse the wave function, and we will get particles. That's, that's what we will see the behavior as particles. Otherwise, if the mind can't do that, you would get waves. You'd get an interference pattern. So that's the nature of this experiment. There I am working on the system itself. That's what it looks like when it's assembled. This is the camera. It's a 3,000 pixel line camera to measure the interference pattern. Uh, the double slit slide is inside this little holder. The, each slit is 10 microns, and they're 200 microns apart. So they're really, really tiny slits. And so when I ask people to imagine that you could put your mind in the vicinity of the slit and see photons go through the slits one at a time, people say, I can't do that. I can't imagine it. And I would say, well, just imagine you could shrink yourself down to about the size of a micron or smaller and slow time down in your imagination and imagine that you could see the photons go through the slits. So if people can't do that, then they can't do the experiment. So we did many pilot tests, uh, and the bottom line is there. So this dot here, uh, the, the zero line here, is what you'd expect by chance, and it's way below chance, statistically speaking. Uh, it turns out that meditators do much, much better than non-meditators. And the reason why we keep track of whether people are meditators or not is because the task involves focused attention. And meditation is all about attention training. So we figured that people who have attention training should be able to do the task better than those who do not, and that is indeed what we find. So strong statistical evidence that when you ask people to do this rather simple task, that the double slit device behaves differently. The particle, they, they we're seeing particle behavior rather than waves. And when no one is asked to observe the system, it behaves like chance. So that, and we then did a, a formal experiment where we selected people who appeared to do well in the first ex experiment and did ran them again through the experiment and we got even stronger results as compared to a control. So then we just said, since we're dealing with non-local effects, the quantum world, things are connected with far distances, not only through space but through time as well. Why don't we do an experiment over the internet where we have a double slit system set up but people can access the, the experiment over the internet and do the same task and see that way we can see whether distance makes a difference. So there's the, the setup, and there's two conditions that you would do in this experiment. You either get a blank screen where you're not observing anything, or you get a screen where you're seeing a squiggly line, and the squiggly line is giving you immediate real-time feedback from the double set itself. And the task is to make the line go up. If the line goes up, it is designed in software to reflect that the wave function is collapsing, that we're seeing more particles than waves. We also had a Linux box programmed to simulate a human. And the reason you do this is you want to make sure that if you get results in this experiment that it wasn't an accident, it wasn't an artifact, it wasn't something wrong with the equipment and so on. So we had a Linux box observing and doing the same thing as humans. And of course the nice thing about that is that the, uh, the double slit system and the server that's sending bits out over the internet, it doesn't know if there's a human on the other end or a Linux box. And we're assuming that Linux boxes are not conscious. Uh, maybe the WAS would think that it was conscious, but probably not. So what the camera sees is an interference pattern. It looks like that. That's what the camera sees. And we're measuring something called fringe visibility, which is how sharp these fringes are. And it's a very simple equation looking at the peak and the trough of adjacent fringes. And so the prediction is that when we're, people are seeing the screen that gives feedback of the system, that the fringes will shrink. And this is, this is where the idea of collapsing the wave function comes from. You're collapsing the wave-like character of, of um, the quantum. So we predict uh, that will be a collapse of interference. This is the result of uh, all data collected in 2013. So when people are observing the 20 fringes that we measured, all collapsed 
and very significantly so, as compared to when the Linux box was looking and there was no collapse at all. So the nice thing about this as well is not only did we get a confirmation of what we saw in the laboratory, but we're able to test does distance matter? And so our laboratory is in California, and the, as, the farthest away you can get from our lab is South Africa, and it's 18,000 kilometers. And we're able to look at all of the, d the dots here are individual trials in the experiment, somebody doing the experiment from some distance away. And the question is, is the slope of the line that goes through this different than zero? Because if the slope of line is different than zero, then we're dealing with something like an electromagnetic force or some kind of force which would decline with distance. But the slope of the line here is zero to six decimal places. So we know that there's no difference. People in South Africa were getting the same result as people a kilometer away from our laboratory. So again, suggesting this really is a quantum effect. So as, as you kind of make sense that even large-scale mind-matter effects make a difference on what you expect to occur. So then to finish, if my button works, there we go, the conclusion is very simple. Mind matters in unexpected ways. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>